and welcome. It's always nice to see smiling faces, people who want to learn this information. Um, my name, as uh, Margaret said, is uh, Frank Morrill. I'm a retired history teacher from high school, and I've been out about 14 years now, so I'm old, uh, but I'm still standing. You know how old I am. This uh, young I lady know, here was I, from my high school class. I know, right? and, I, and I resent your saying you're old. And I've owned this collection. I'm going to give you all that information as we go through. You'll see who's owned them and whatever that's in there. And Dr. Greenwood, Jeanette Greenwood, I, uh, I found along the way after I got these negatives, I didn't know what I had. I didn't know what they were. And I talked with a gentleman from the uh, American Antiquarian Society who is a, a friend and a neighbor of mine. And he said, you have what? And I started explaining that I had 30 at the time. Now there were 242 after a gazillion hours of looking for them. I said what I had. And he said, let me give you a name. And there she sits. Because Jeanette has uh, written books on this very subject, the migration of blacks from the North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia area to Worcester. Mm -hmm. And without actually writing about some of these people, did not even know that pictures of them existed. So for the last five years, uh, we have been friends and researchers. She's taught me a ton about research, being a high school teacher as opposed to a college professor, you, know, you don't do a ton of research compared to what she did. So I've learned a great deal. So we're going to go through that now. And I would like to say, college professor, high school teacher, if you have a question, shout it out, interrupt us. We are so used to being interrupted. <laughs> Usually it's can I go to the bathroom, but you know, if you, yeah. that's right. Then, yeah, that's not a problem. So we'll begin. Uh, this was at the Worcester Art Museum for four months. Uh, it was a long exhibit. Uh, in from 2017 into 2018 uh, and you came to see that as, yeah. as many people here did uh, so this is a little different this is this is us doing this this is not affiliated in a way that because they're my negatives obviously and so I've changed this around a little bit with the people of color we we are going I'm going to give you a little more about bullet himself as we go through and uh, that that was missing before well, we like this picture we've always liked this little Ralphie uh, he didn't last too long after a few years after this he passed away but you can see he's sitting there saying take the darn picture I'd say something else with my grandson <laughs> <laughs> you know just it's a really a neat shot yeah. so this is this is him he uh, lived from 1876 to 1918 he's buried down in at Putnam Heights down in uh, Putnam Connecticut next to his family his mom down there and it is his life and legacy. I'm sure he, I, I love that picture of him. That's his farm in North Brookfield on Bullard Road, right near the East Brookfield line. Bullard Road's still there. The farm is no longer there. He moved from Worcester to there. Uh, it's a great shot of him. Uh, he was kind of a, a, a happy-go-lucky guy it's, throughout most of what you see. You'll see photographs of that. In the archive, I have all 5,400 of those negatives. Is it not uncommon for people at that time to be smiling? Very uncommon. You'll see more of that. You think he's smiling now, yeah, watch. This is, uh, this is Bill, Bill Bullard here. This is his brother Marcus who found him. He killed himself at 41 and a half years old. Oh. He hung himself nearby. Uh, I, I remember I got a little one here, but this is his grandmother. Uh, that's his mother's grandmother. That's his nephew. That's Marcus's wife and that's their cousin. Um, I would like, he lived till 1969. Wow. I would love to have a chance to meet and speak with him. Ten minutes with him would have solved a lot of research, <laughs> what we've done. There he is. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe he had a few drinks. Uh, it looked like he was having fun and he did a lot of walking. Uh, yeah, they, that's unusual. That's an unusual photograph. That could have been done remotely. Uh, that could have his hands appear. One hand is missing as possible. They did have the possibility to do it with a mechanical but it's easy to set the camera up and have someone else push it. And there he is, to show you how clever he is, that's him, and that's his derby hat on a sunflower. So he had some, some fun going on. This is uh, North Brookfield, bandstand, and he's standing rather, rather dignified there. This is a great shot. We found this one very late. This was, now you're gonna see pictures that weren't in the Worcester exhibit. This was not in it. And uh, we thought about putting it in. I found it at the last moment. Uh, he wasn't in the military, so that's very unusual. Hmm. Uh, he absolutely was not in the military. I've spoken to all the records people, to the commander of the Mass National Guard. I did blow this up greatly because the negatives are in incredible condition. I blew this up. It's 1902. These are marksman's medals and the date's right on them. 
1902. This is a uh, Massachusetts militia. We would know it as the National Guard uniform. Uh, well, he liked the military. His brother Henry was in the military, but he liked it a lot. And there he is with a Cook's hat on. Different stripes. He's having a great time. This is in Framingham. It came Framingham, where his brother Henry was. So he must have just thought, hey, I'll put a uniform on and have some fun. There he is, cleaning something. I'm not sure what. But again, now he's got three stripes. He's been promoted <laughs> um, while he hasn't been in. And this is a quick shot of Worcester in 1899 to give you an idea. This is Park Ave, right down here. You can see the, con the concentration. This is not all. I had done this early, and uh, I beg forgiveness of a premier researcher here. I did not update this. There's many more dots I could put in. And you can see there's another section over in here as you're going up into John Street in that area. But we focused on this. There are many more dots that would go in each dot representing a family or a portrait. And this is where he lived right there so you can see he lived right in the area right nearby to give you an idea where this is uh, this area where this is this was their church that'll pop up later a wooden church and right over here this is CVS hmm. right here this is looking up towards Worcester State College nice scene this is still there Wow. <laughs> same one it's got a big nick out of it over here go over and take a look at it I have it's the same one uh, this is looking down Park Ave and you are looking towards this. This is uh, Harrington Richardson Gun Manufacturing. It's now Walgreen Drug. See, well, if you have this big, beautiful brick building, you tear it down, leave it vacant for a while, then put in the drugstore because certainly we don't have enough of those. <laughs> so this was Worcester Slipper right here. And now this is all gone. As you know, there's not a single one of them left. This is where he lived. This is right around the corner. That's a present picture today. I found an interesting thing. I should, I'm not going to say I found it. A person, a Dr. Maurice Wallace from the University of Virginia, uh, who is a black professor who wrote on the back of our catalog, who was writing for the, for the second edition of the catalog, did some research, sent it to me, said, what do you know about George Morrill? My last name is M-O-R-R-I-L-L. -L. I said, uh, I don't know. I have a cousin. He said, no, back at this time, this was a two family. Well, of course, being an adequate researcher, I researched when his family moved there. Who moved there with him? The other half of the house, George Morrow was living there. And I thought, and he was a photographer. And he was about Bullard's age. So I've done a lot of research on that. And I've contacted George Morrow's grandchildren. Not a single slide of his exists. Not a picture of him exists. I've talked to everybody as much as I possibly could. Nothing. But imagine that. What a coincidence that I own these now and George Morrow lived next door. I, it, it looks like it's a, I, it would be a third cousin of my grandfather's, the closest I can get to it. Anyway, that's where he lived. This is where he lived in North Brookfield, 1908. Now, I got a surprise coming for you. I've got a surprise. Oh, yes, it's, oh, what a treat. Look at, she's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember when I used to send those to you? He said, look what I found. And she sent back, yeah, I'm busy. So, uh, <laughs> kind of like my wife would do when I run up from down cellar, look what I found. She said, supper's ready. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'm having fun, right? That's the key. That's, that's a fantastic house right now. It's a hole in the ground. I just awarded her with a brick from the chimney, and you'll see the chimney. There's still some of it left. Okay. That's his home, 1908. Yes? I feel like I'm in school again. Uh, what happened? No, you don't even have to. Please, you don't have to raise your hand. Just... Scream out. Yes. What happened to the farm? Or do I want to know? Uh, well, I it's, I, I've them. got all the deeds. Uh, they kept selling off one lot, one lot, one lot. Uh, there's 22 acres left to the bullet farm. Oh, uh, initially, it looked like it was around 57 acres. It's still on the corner. If you go by it right here, go another 150 feet right here, take a left, go about a three quarters of a mile, that's Brookfield Orchards. Oh, okay. Give you an idea where it is. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, excuse me? Frank? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Well, on that two family you showed in Worcester, mm -hmm. just previous, what street was that? That, uh, that used to be Mayfield Street. That's why I couldn't find them, because what happened about 50 years ago, they said, let's not call that Mayfield Street anymore. Let's take Mayfield Street and move it across the street, what used to be Bradford Street, and then Mayfield Street, let's call that something close to it, Maple Tree Lane. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went looking, I couldn't find it. Then I looked in that 1899 map, and I said, wait a minute. And I drove back there. So it's, it's that kind of, they don't do that often, you know, that kind of a change. Thank you. This is inside that house. That's his study in the house. 
And the only reason I found that is because I found his grandmother in the kitchen cooking. And then when I looked through the doorway, I found another room, another room, and I said, wait a minute, because he didn't label any of this stuff. So that is absolutely his study. That's his picture of his house that I just showed you, right on the wall. He loved his own work. So he put his own picture on the wall. These are all his pictures. I have all those negatives, they're all on the wall. I looked closely, I blew this up huge with really high resolution. Please, I can read those books, no problem, they're all history books, the Annals of American History. I wanted to see a box of negatives. You know, can I see one? No. They stored those in a different spot. This is where he took a picture in the mirror. We have a brick. She now has a brick from this, from that chimney. Uh, well, that's what it looked like. The ghost behind it, he took that remotely also. But he, it's nice to know because it gives you a chance to see what kind of camera. Now, the research questions that I face and she faced, you know, where did he learn his remarkable photographic skills? Because we heard and have found in the art museum and other experts have said, yeah, he may be an itinerant photographer, but this is some incredible skill this man has. Good luck trying to find out where, because even when you look at the photographic clubs, he wasn't a member of anything. He was just around. I do have a big surprise coming for you. I'm waiting. Why did he, <laughs> why did he take a strong interest in the black community? He took 40% of the pictures of of people standing outside of blacks, yet they're only 2% of the population, 10% in that neighborhood. There's a reason for that. We don't know what it is. His grandfather lived around the corner, uh, and I, that house is still standing on Bird Street, was in the Civil War, was in serious battles, came back. Did he bring back a couple of former slaves, as soldiers often did, or ministers who went down there? Did he say to his son, look, do you know what was going on? His grandson. Did, that could have gone on, and he could have felt some kind of kinship or understanding. We don't know. Did he frequently sell his photographs? Well, it's only in the log book, which you see a couple pages. There's an exhibit out there, and I took a couple pages and, and blew them up so you could see. If you see 15 cents, 25 cents, not very often. So yes, he did. Yes, he did sell them, but not very often. And what inspired him to travel to so many communities? You're going to see he traveled to 40... Uh, 45 I had before, it's really 43. 43 communities as far away as Buffalo. He's riding on a bike and train and all over the place. Here we go, surprise for you. I found this, as this has been located in the Brookfield Times, Brookfield Mass newspaper, 1898, Lake Lashaway, 1898. <coughs> this is, tells you that these people are waiting. I have lots of these pictures. I now know what they are. Yeah. He took lots of them image by William Bullard. 1898, he didn't, we now know he was only 22 years old. I never knew that he went to the Brookfields before, so we now have a connection. He didn't move there until 1908. None of his pictures of the Brookfields are before 1908. And so you say, okay, <laughs> more research. I thought you'd like that. I like it, I love it. Okay. And this is some of the places he went and when he went. I'm not going to leave it on there very long, but, and I don't know why these are over here. I think they went a little crazy on the bottom, but they're supposed to be over here. And you see the different years. That's just some of the communities. And the one down here, like Middlefield, Bridgewater, Camp Westfield, these, uh, Camp Westfield, there's another one floating on here. Those were all camps, soldiers. He took about 800 pictures of soldiers in all these camps. Great pictures of soldiers training. Some all the tents, I mean, they have phenomenal pictures. Mm. And that's his first picture right up there. He was 18. It's in Newport, Rhode Island. And, and I have that negative, obviously. That's the first one. It's, it's in the logbook. It, and so these are the interests. He took 50 pictures. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but 50 pictures of, uh, with trolleys in them. I, I pulled them all. I have them in a separate album now. 150 trains and depots. I pulled all of those, put, printed them in my dark room, and I have those separately. 300 ice wagons. I mean, it was fascinating. Walker ice, independent ice, people's ice, Tatnik ice, <laughs> ice wagons, cutting the ice inside the factory, everywhere, every ice wagon. Walker ice had 92 wagons, you've got them all. That's an obsession. 600 soldiers training, and then there's a couple hundred others not training. 242 African American, Native American, because I meant to say that along with some, there was a mixture, Jeanette will be talking about that later. He was also a school photographer in North Brookfield and East Brookfield took a number of school photos in Holden and Worcester. He was really good in Holden because he was able to uh, tell me the teacher, where the school was, 
but I don't know if kids, but you could find a lot of that. He really listed those. Not so in Worcester. I've spoken to people, like the gentleman I hoped would be here tonight, we'll talk about him later, who I bought the negatives from. His grandmother and grandfather had their picture taken while in school, and it was his grand, when they were young kids, his grandfather's the one that ended up buying the collection. Mm -hmm. And he actually himself knew Bill and had his picture taken as a, as a little kid. And this is his death, after he died, this is his uh, the, the certificate of death, North Brookfield. I put that on there for a reason, because back in those days, they were very, you know how we're technologically inclined? Look at this. What test confirmed his diagnosis, the doctors, that he hung himself? He viewed it. Yeah, that pretty much shows you <laughs> that he hung himself. That actually what he wrote. He just viewed it. Nothing else. So, you know, you want more, but it's all you're getting. And he was hanging for three weeks before they found him. So he died. Uh, he wasn't working the last year, the last six months. There's no evidence that he took pictures. He died in April of 1918. And he was uh, very much, uh, according to the newspaper accounts, very much despondent. Uh, right here you can see. Body was found by his two brothers and one other man who's not listed here. Oh. Dale. Trying to think of his last name. He, one other man was there. The man who sold me the photographs was friendly with the, he's still living, the grandson of the guy that found him. And I've spoken with him on the phone. He's an attorney. He's up in age now because this was 1918. And uh, I haven't met up with him yet. But anyway, his, his mother had died. He was always living with his mother since birth. Uh, he never married. And so that was tough for him. And then despondent because of ill health. And that's what took him down. That's his grace thing. Down in. And here's what happened to him. He kept him for 24 years because he took him. They went in the back shed at that house in North Brookville. <coughs> and then this brother, Charlie, who he took lots of pictures of, lots of farm pictures, lots of family pictures, over 120 of his family and everything surrounding, picking fruit and all kinds of stuff. Charlie uh, wasn't interested in photography. So they just sat there for 40 years. And this guy who had his picture taken by him, when he was a little kid, kept bugging him. He was his postman. This man was a postman and kept going there. Finally, as Charlie got old, he said, fine, I'll sell him to you. So he moved him to East Brookfield. And his grandson, this is Dennis, who I bought him from, lived with him. So after he passed away, he had the house. So they stayed for 45 years in that house. 40 years in that house, 45 years in that house, and now 16 years in my house. Did that sum it up for you quickly? That's my granddaughter, and that's the discovery. How do we discover I even had these? He said, I'd like to sell you all these negatives. You're using them all the time. You're printing them. You should have them. I said, fine, I'll take all of these. He said, well, t you have to take them all. I said, well, I don't want to buy the, the uh, portraits, you know, the old, old, hundreds of boxes. I don't really want the portraits. You, know, you don't know who they are. All right, fine. I'll buy them all. I put them on a shelf. And that was 2003. Ten years later in 2013, I'm working with my granddaughter, who's now going to be 16 in April. I was working with her writing a book on Worcester. We've now done three books together. And I said, look through these boxes. Let me go. Most of my boxes were all put away and they're in archival sleeves, but there's still 50 or 60 floating around that I didn't, I said, not in a portrait. So I said, look through, boxes. look through these. If you see some streets, some really good stuff, buildings with names. I just wanted to give a practice. She was 10. I wanted to give a practice for that. So she would put them aside, put them aside, and then she'd find one to have a uh, building in it that we could identify and put that, with, maybe we'll put that in the book on Worcester with one. And then she held this one up right here. And she said, calls me Pip, for Pip, Pip, what's this a negative open? I, I looked at it in, in a brilliant way. I examined it and I said, I have no idea. I have no clue what that is. I, I know that it's an African-American woman, a black woman, a colored woman, a Negro. I explained those to her, all the terms. It was a great teaching moment. I explained all of that and I said, put it aside. I don't know. A long time went by. We're back working on a Charlton book. And she chastised, my, chastised me. It's down cellar where I do all this. And the negative was still on the way side of my desk. You didn't put this away. I said, yeah, I get to it. So she picks up. She's looking. She says, why is there a number on the back? It's right here. That isn't it. But that's where it is. It's scratched in really small. And I said, really? And I looked. And once again, I thought for a moment. And I said, I have no idea. So I thought for a while, and I said, wait a minute, I have a book, a log book that I got when I bought all this collection. Do not tell me this man recorded who these people were. I know by these people, I don't mean, I'm not speaking about blacks in, in a, I'm saying 
people because he all whites, he has buildings also recorded. So I went to look. Sure enough, he wrote Celia Perkins. And shortly after that, she came onto the scene and I will let her pick it up here. I will, you'll, you'll see me interrupting her periodically. You're allowed to stay up here. I'm going to sit. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. Um, well, Frank didn't even tell you the most embarrassing story about all this. I have to tell it on myself, I guess. I, I, I try to leave it out because I <laughs> did beat you up with it a lot. I know. I did get beaten up with this a lot. Frank contacted, well, I got an email out of the blue uh, soon after this discovery of the Celia <coughs> Perkins uh, negative. And uh, it was December, and I was busy, and I was grading, and I was like, I don't know who this guy is. I'll get back to him. This guy. This guy. <laughs> and I forgot. This old guy. I didn't, I didn't know you were old. <laughs> anyway, I didn't get back to him. And because I was, you know, it was Christmas time, and, and I forgot. And in January, he was persistent, and he contacted me again. And I, uh, I live in Providence, and I... still I, have that email, the second one. <laughs> And I thought, you know, I'm going up to Worcester tomorrow. Um, maybe I should just see what he has. So um, we talked on the phone. I realized, you know, he seemed pretty legitimate and uh, <laughs> got his directions to his house and that sort of I thing. I fooled her. And um, <laughs> went to see what he had. And he started bringing, I didn't learn how to do this. The right hand side. Yeah. He started bringing up these images on this incredible, beautiful Mac monitor that he has. Uh, I almost fell out of my seat. I mean, I just couldn't believe them. I thought, first of all, they're just incredibly beautiful, and they were of uh, people of color. And I had, as Frank said, I had written this book about uh, the migration of former slaves to Worcester during and after the, uh, the Civil War up to like 1900. And I just thought, wow, these are these are just amazing. Was, oh, well, by the way, you know, I have I have Bullard's logbook, and I have. Their names, we know who a lot of them are. And then I was like, are you really, really? And then, you know, that time I probably did fall out of my chair. And I started looking at the names, and it was astonishing to me because I was like, wait a minute, I know who some of these people are. Uh, people I had studied, people I had never seen, who had yet left very few records behind, and then they show up in things like censuses and, and things like that. So I, I just thought it was phenomenal. I thought we really had something incredible here. I say we, uh, because it's of course I glommed onto this right away and I said, what are we going to do with this? I, I um, would add here, because I interrupt all the time, just, yeah, I would add too. here that we did not know at that time how incredibly rare this was. So we had a meeting with people yeah. and then people say, yeah, there are no collections like this <laughs> in the United States. With the, there are bigger collections. There are collections of blacks. There are, but you know who they are. Yeah, lots, even the most famous <laughs> collections, like W.E.B. Du Bois did this very famous collection for the Paris Exposition in 1900 of African Americans, and uh, many of those folks are simply not named. It's just sort of unknown man, unknown woman, and I thought, oh my gosh, we really have something here, because not only can we, do we know who we are and we can tell their stories, we can trace them backwards and find out, you know, all about them as much as we can, we can also trace them forwards and we can find family members and that was a really huge part of what we did and really one of the most gratifying things that we did and so uh, Celia Perkins um, was uh, and I should also say the other I mean, we'll get back to the Perkins in a minute um, I immediately and Frank of course was uh, was a big part of this too uh, I, I immediately thought that what a great project this would be for my students at Clark uh, because they could do the research too. They could, you know, really learn the research process. They could meet descendants. This is a photo of two of my students who were deeply involved in this project, meeting with um, the descendants of this woman, mm -hmm. Sylvia Perkins. And uh, we'd work on the family tree here, and it was really uh, quite amazing to them because they had not ever seen pictures of their ancestors at this, at this level, at this stage, at these early ancestors. Um, so I got students working on this right away. Um, we ended up teaching two seminars uh, at Clark uh, that focused on the Bullard, uh, pro uh, Bullard photographs. I did another one this past fall, so there are three total so far. We're still working on these. Um, and it was really amazing you know, to assign students a photograph and say, find out what you can about this person. And um, I've dealt with students in lots of different kinds of research situations before, but this was really different because they felt when there was something about seeing the face of these people, you want to know about her. 
Um, you want to know her background. You want to know uh, where she came from. Um, there was this real strong sense of commitment that the students had uh, to each of these people. They took it very seriously. They wanted to get the information right. They wanted to make sure that they had it down. Um, and uh, there was something, again, just as we, you know, looking at these, a photo like this, we connect to the, the person. Um, it was a really different kind of research project. It wasn't like a topic, some abstract thing with an individual. Um, so the students did a really good job and played a big part in the exhibition itself uh, that was held, as Frank said, at the Worcester Public, or the Worcester Art Museum, sorry, um, in beginning October 2017 and ran through February 2000. 18 and uh, was very well uh, received in the community uh, and uh, lots of people attended and we really had a marvelous time. Um, we worked with Nancy Burns who's shown here on the right um, who's the, the curator of uh, photographs, prints and drawings at the Worcester Art Museum and uh, the Art Museum did a really beautiful job of uh, displaying these. Uh, we showed uh, Bullard's log book and we have some um, copies uh, pages you can see out here in, in, in the cases uh, where he, he and again you see the numbers here that were scratched into the corner of each negative and the names of the person uh, the people so um, yeah copies of the log book on the display case right there Try to take okay. care of things. that's right um, so you can even see you know the way he, in some t cases he sort of just went down the street and you can kind of match up the names and the numbers with uh, the various city directories and things and see how he operated because again he never had a studio he often I think just sort of walked through the neighborhood or people got a scent knew that he was coming and they had their photograph taken and one thing it's important to remember again when you look at these photographs and it's something I certainly had to remind my students in a day and age when we're constantly taking selfies and photographs of ourselves every day it was a huge deal to have your photograph taken I mean you may only have this happen a few times in your life um, so uh, it was something that people really did take quite seriously, as you could see in the way that they dressed and chose to present themselves in the photographs. Um, we had a light box at the museum, so we could actually show uh, the negatives, and you could see uh, what they what they look like. And here are just some folks looking at various things. But I'll tell you about some of the folks here um, that we learned about, and this is. Um, the first person, woman, you saw Celia Perkins, who sort of was the beginning of all of this. Uh, this is her husband, Edward, um, with his uh, sister Rose and his brother Abraham. And um, when we began to look, you know, really do research into this uh, family, along with so many other people, we just found some amazing stories. And it turns out that this family, the, the Perkinses, um, were actually, um, they had been slaves, had born, been born into slavery in Camden, South Carolina. And they belong to uh, Senator and uh, Senator James Chestnut and his wife Mary Boykin Chestnut. Is that Mary Chestnut? Yes. Exact same. Yeah. Thank you very much. She yes. was the owner. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> if you know anything about the Civil War, it's one of the most. Book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the most probably quoted, uh, re most read uh, diaries of the Civil War. If you've ever seen Ken Burns' series, he's constantly quoting Mary Boykin Chestnut because she was, you know, she wrote this, you know, diary, kept notes during the Civil War uh, and commented on all kinds of things. So you sort of see the war through, through her eyes. Well, they were, they belonged to the Chestnut family. And um, I was able to go to Camden um, and where I was able to do some research and I found out and also through some research um, in the census is that they were property owners. Five years after the Civil War in 1870, they already owned something like 200, over 200 acres worth of property. Extremely rare for people coming out of slavery. Um, but their names, again, are in the, the plantation books of James Chestnut, and I was able to get, find those in Camden, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But they, it turns out they actually bought some of the plantation property that was up for sale because the Chestnut family uh, was, or I should say, the, uh, yeah, James Chestnut family um, was deeply in debt after the Civil War, as many planters were, and they had to sell off the property. <laughs> and so uh, the Perkinses managed uh, both, you know, this, this group of children, and I should say these are three of 23 children. <laughs> of a, a slave of, of, a, a slave, and then of course a former emancipated slave by the name of King Perkins who is, has his own incredible story. He was born in 1810, sorry no, 18, let's get it right, 1802 and died in 1912. 1912. Right. Wow. 110. Um, so he had a lot of time to have 23 children. He did. I'm, I'm, I'm sure several wives at least. 
Uh, but when he died, he showed up in the Camden paper on the front page. He was very well known in the community. And again, that was another really interesting link because that newspaper article, his obituary confirmed that the family did, you know, did belong to uh, 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 Senator Chestnut and Mary Boykin uh, Chestnut. Um, so they bought land. They were very, again, very unusual. That was the great deepest desire of all emancipated slaves was to be able to own their own land. They bought plantation land that they had worked on <coughs> as slaves themselves. They were surrounded by their father, king, and other family members. But they lose that land by the 1870s. Again, it's a very dark time uh, in South Carolina history at the end of Reconstruction where uh, white supremacy would once again uh, reigned supreme in, um, in South Carolina. The Ku Klux Klan was, was very active in this area. Uh, it was a very difficult time economically. They weren't able to pay taxes and they lost their land. So it was about that time then they ended up coming to Worcester. And they had a connection in Worcester through Celia's sister. And that's another whole story I could tell you later. Maybe I don't want to get into it now. but. Um, Anyway, there was an interesting Civil War connection there that brought Celia's sister to Worcester, and then they followed in their path. And this, the Perkinses ended up being the most photographed family in the entire collection. Um, they were photographed over 30 times. This is an extended family. There's a lot of them. A lot of them, and they liked having their picture taken. This is one of our favorites of Edward uh, standing in a Cabbage. field of, does anybody know what this Cabbage. is? No, that's what no. I thought it was. That's what we too. thought it was. No. Yeah. Think about it. They're from the it's South. That's collard greens. Collard greens. Collard greens. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> I thought it was cabbage. And we uh, titled this at the uh, exhibition that this was uh, a, a picture of the literal transplantation of Southern culture to Worcester. <laughs> the property ownership was really important to them. They lost their land in South Carolina, but they were property owners in Worcester, and they actually owned quite a bit of uh, property down in. Um, the Beaverbrook area. Uh, so the Perkins, in many ways, represent the sort of stream of people who come from Camden, South Carolina. There were so many people from Camden that this part of Beaverbrook actually got called Little Camden. And I gave a talk down in Big Camden, South Carolina, about a year ago, and they were fascinated by this. And I actually met quite a few people there um, who talked about having relatives in Worcester uh, and that sort of thing. So that was a really interesting kind of uh, highway back and forth between the South and the North, uh, beginning in the era of the Civil War. Um, there were a lot of folks from North Carolina as well, uh, particularly from New Bern, North Carolina. This is something that I had written about uh, in my book. Um, there were a lot of uh, white soldiers and missionary teachers who were stationed in New Bern, North Carolina during the Civil War from Worcester County, two particular uh, Worcester County regiments. Um, and there were quite a few folks who ended up, <laughs> I'm going to trip over that, I know. Um, there were quite a few, uh, there were some um, early migrants, former slaves, who ended up coming north with uh, white Worcester soldiers uh, during and after the Civil War. And the Ward family is a very early family that does that. And these are three uh, members of the Ward family, all born here in Worcester, but their mother was from New Bern, North Carolina. Um, and uh, uh, they were, I'm trying to remember the names, Harriet, uh, James Harold, and Clarence uh, Ward. The, the little boy in the center, uh, was born in 1900. We, uh, we, there are three pictures of him. One of them is the cutest little thing. He's sitting by himself, and you can see he's drooling he's now. He's teething. The picture actually, the negative looks like this. I could lighten these and make them anything I want. This, the family was very, very, very dark. The son, the actual son of that little boy in the middle is still living. We went to visit him in, not in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. We went down to visit him, have a he rose from being that little that little boy's son. He died in 1932 when this man that we know was seven. He's buried. He's buried at uh, Hope Cemetery. And the gentleman rose from North High, humble beginnings. And the one who's still he's 92 now, not in the best of health now, but 92, still sharp, still honorary. And, and we enjoyed our visit. And he rose up to be executive vice president of Marriott Corporation. Oh wow! So he, he went to Cornell. He did okay out of North High School. Yeah. He told us all about the discrimination he faced in the service. And so it's a direct connection there. It was wonderful to bring that picture to him. Yeah, because he had never seen, never seen a, a picture of his father at, at this age mm -hmm. anyway. Um, there were also folks who came from Virginia. Um, for a long time, we called this photo, and this was, it was labeled as such in the, uh, in the uh, museum exhibition. 
um, we said this, these were the Jackson children, which is what Bullard called them. Um, and one of the great joys about all of this, as Frank has already indicated, is that research keeps unfolding. Um, there was a family member who came um, to this exhibition. We would actually worked with a woman uh, in Worcester, Benetta Kufour, um, who thought that they might be related to her. Um, some of you may know the story of Bethany Vini, who was a, uh, a slave, had been a slave in Virginia. She was uh, purchased by an abolitionist from Providence, and she ends up in Worcester. Um, she writes a story of her life, which you can actually, as a slave, which you can actually read online. Um, and uh, her descendant, Benetta Kufour, said, "This, you know, that this might be my." Bethany Vini's uh, grandchildren, they could be my you know, great grandmas. We just couldn't quite you know, document that. But Benetta's sister came to the exhibition. She says, that's Grandma Lena and Aunt Blanche. I have that picture. <laughs> um, so that you know, was Amazing. all we needed to know that who in fact they were, and they are in fact the grandchildren of Bethany Vini. Um, oh, this is a photo, this is a beautiful one. In fact, this is one that the museum actually had postcards made of this one. This one and Ralph, the first one you last, saw. Last photograph I found that was using the exhibit just before we went to print pictures, I found this one. Mm -hmm. Um, so not only were people coming from the South to Worcester at this time, African Americans, there were people, African Americans from other parts of the North coming to Worcester to work, mainly for various kinds of jobs. Um, this was Raymond Schuyler, who was born in Troy, New York, and came to Worcester in the 1880s, um, and with uh, four of his children. Uh, Raymond ended up working for the Boston and Maine Railroad for many, many years, well-known uh, person, leader in the community, uh, very ch a family is very active even to this day at All Saints Episcopal Church in uh, Worcester, and he um, was also an early member of the NAACP, and when he died in 1956, he was the oldest member of, of that organization. Mm -hmm. And so the Schuyler, again, we worked very closely with members of the Schuyler family, and uh, they yeah, you'll gave a us a lot coming. of information. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is James and Jenny Johnson, again, represent another, another kind of migration and, and kind of community building taking place in this era. Uh, James Johnson, uh, was both Native American and African American. Um, he uh, claimed um, membership as both a, a Nipmuc uh, Indian and a Narragansett Indian, and also African American background. Again, that was a comp that was a coming together of two communities that began in the 18th century uh, here in New England. Um, he married uh, a woman from South Carolina, Charleston, uh, Jenny Bradley, and these are their two children. And they're a very interesting family in lots of ways, again, very active in the community. Uh, and a good example of how uh, the sort of dual identity, again, of Native American and African American that got passed down to subsequent generations. And again, this was a family uh, f descendants we worked with very closely uh, in the exhibition who, again, both claim Native American ancestry as well as African American. And James himself uh, was very active, and the family's active in the AME Zion Church, one of the, of the black churches here in Worcester. Uh, and he also belonged to a Native American organization called the Heirs of the Narragansett. So again, that dual heritage again, was something that was very important. Um, we got a good sense of community life, again, which we were able to research much more deeply, especially through some Boston newspapers that carried a regular Worcester column that gave us a lot of in indication about what was going on. And this was a tiny community, 1 to 2 percent of the overall population of Worcester, but extremely active. Just many, many clubs, um, three uh, African-American churches that were very, act very busy uh, doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, this was uh, the Reverend William Perry and his family, who were all Virginia-born. Um, he was the pastor of the Bethel AME Church, which was no longer exists, but was in the Beaverbrook neighborhood. I think Frank pointed it out, I think, on the map. You're going to see it. Oh, okay. And there's a picture Are of it coming up. There, oh, it there it is. There it is. Okay. <laughs> in in fairness it. to her, that we've done this talk a number of times, but <coughs> if I sometimes prepare, or she sometimes prepare, if we don't get together to see, to look at what we prepared, we don't know which ones we stuck in. So I, I put that one in there. Yeah, good. Okay. And this is the John Street Church, of course, which is still there. Um, again, founded by former slaves, um, established in the 1880s at that spot. And John Street, again, is another uh, important um, pocket of African Americans in Worcester. Beaverbrook uh, had, you know, again, these were these were integrated neighborhoods. They were it was never a black neighborhood per se in Worcester. Mm -hmm against a small community. So Beaverbrook was, you know, again, a very diverse community, but had a pocket 
of African Americans and Native Americans. The other important pocket on the west side of Worcester was around the John Street Church. Many North Carolina and Virginia migrants lived in that area. Um, again, this is, a, a we think, a group of Sunday school children um, that uh, Buller took. Again, really gives you a good sense of sort of the kinds of things going on in the community. Um, another important organization was called the Knights of Pythias, which was a fraternal organization. There was a Masonic, uh, a black Masonic chapter in Worcester, Temple, I should say, in Worcester. There was also a lot of other organizations like the Knights of Pythias. And we really like this photograph because, again, this was an organization that was meant to sort of for self-help and, and, you know, emphasizing, uh, you know, manhood and responsibility and things like that, especially at a time when, you know, black men were under all kinds of attack, uh, po you know, in the, in the popular mind at this time for, you know, for being criminal and all these other kinds of horrible stereotypes. And what we loved about this photo was that this man is posing in his Knights of Pythias uniform, um, holding his, his daughter, we don't know if a boy or a girl, but holding his child, you know, so kind of unusual <coughs> combination there. And, and to us it really uh, meant, it was again a very conscious effort on his part um, to emphasize his fatherhood, his responsibility to his child, um, and as being an upstanding member of the community. Is, excuse me. Is he identified with Knights we, of Pythias through buttons or? The uniform. Yeah. Yeah, for a long time we thought maybe it was a military uniform, and I just happened to, you know, one day I just got it be in my bonnet, I got to figure out what this is, and I found a, a Knights of Pythias uniform on eBay, of all places, it was being sold, and I was able to identify it. Um, Reuben Griffin is another person, one of the things we stressed in, in our uh, e exhibition was uh, the kind of assertion of citizenship <coughs> again at the time. Most of these pictures being taken around 1900 at a time when African Americans in the South are losing the ability to vote with disfranchisement laws that are being put in place by Southern states, by um, Jim Crow segregation laws also being uh, established in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, and lynching also occurring um, in, in a very uh, explicit, regular kind of way uh, in the South at this time. Um, so we found, we, Reuben Griffin um, had his portrait taken at least five times uh, by uh, William Bullard and uh, always in uniform and I was able to get his military yeah. records. Even inside his, own, him. inside his home. Yeah. yeah, and he was a very proud veteran of the Spanish-American War. And he was, had served in what was known as Company L of the Massachusetts Sixth Infantry uh, in the Spanish-American War. And the Massachusetts Sixth was the only regiment, um, as far as we can tell, um, in the Spanish-American War that had a, was, a, was a white unit but had one company of African-American soldiers. So this, of course, is a time when the U.S. military is still, it's a Jim Crow military that's separated out. But Company L was all um, African Americans and Native Americans. And uh, Reuben Griffin saw some action in Puerto Rico. He was very proud of his service. And his photographs, again, I think really reflect that, that he's someone who, again, is asserting himself as a citizen of this country, as someone who is willing to fight and you know, possibly die for the United States and to have his photograph taken, uh, again, with the kind of pride uh, that he had in that service, I think was very indicative of um, a lot of the sentiment of uh, other people like him um, at this time. Is there anything else you want to add about that? Okay. David Oswell, we could do an hour on him. He was <laughs> an amazing more. individual um, who was known as Professor Oswell in Worcester. Um, he was born in Worcester, uh, Boston, sorry, in, in the 1830s. Died in 1902. Died in 1902, soon after this uh, photograph was taken. And he was very well known as a professor of music. He wrote his own music, wrote his own scores, um, had his own orchestra. We found advertisements for his orchestra in African-American newspapers and in places like New York and, and Boston. And he also taught um, both violin and uh, guitar. And when he died in 1902, he had a very extensive obituary, and they said um, in the obituary that he had taught 
guitar and, and violin to uh, children of the most prominent white families in Worcester. So he's very well known uh, in the community and someone who clearly was very, again, very proud, uh, hold, the, even the way he holds his mm -hmm. viola. Uh, these are some more of the Perkins family. We had lots of pictures of bicycles and you can so see some out there as well. Um, this was a, 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 a part of a national craze of people riding their bicycles everywhere. Um, this was also the era of Major Taylor, uh, the, you know, the world champion bicyclist who lived in Worcester at this time and was very active in uh, a black bicycle club known as the Albion Club, um, which I'm sure, sure had a big impact um, on this community. So when they, he was a world champion in 1899, um, well known uh, all over the world for uh, his bicycling skills. And again, really interesting, I think, photos in terms of the way what the, the both Rose and Ike Perkins, her nephew, um, decided to pose with their bicycles. Why do you think they would have done that? You could pose with anything, really. Here, mm -hmm. bullets coming down the street, but I'm going to pose with my bicycle. Um, what's the message there, do you think? That's Why would freedom, freedom independence? Okay, I think that's a big part of it. I'm going to represent yeah, yourself with your bike. horses, carriages, cars. Yeah, kind bike. of modern and yeah. hip and up to date. Here's success. my wheels. Yeah, success. my wheels. I own such a piece. Exactly. Yes. I own this. I own this, this. Yeah. I own this yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, this shows, again, this is a, is a kind of a status symbol mm -hmm. of, of yeah, sorts. It's almost frivolous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there are quite a few people had their photo taken with bicycles. So um, another uh, prominent family in, in Worcester is a coachman. Um, Thomas and Margaret Dillon posing in their uh, their parlor and very much uh, you can see in all of these um, a lot about aspiration um, maybe they didn't really have a lot of money but you know they were gonna they were aspiring certainly to perhaps have more uh, and have more of a, of a place uh, here uh, he was a coachman she was a laundress um, again I think the important emphasis on family here someone who's obviously very proud uh, father uh, with and, and proud mother with their children. And one thing we really loved about this was the poster in the back. I don't know how well you can see it, um, but it's for the Worcester Agriculture Agricultural Fair in 1902. And President Roosevelt uh, had come to Worcester, to Theodore Roosevelt, and they had that poster in their uh, in their in their parlor. Mm -hmm. We have pictures of very of various kinds of people at work. Um, Eugene Shepard, who worked as a conductor on the train. Again, this is a really fascinating photograph in so many ways because you get the interior of, of a train. He was, he was a coach cleaner, a train cleaner um, in Worcester um, at, the, at the main railroad station. And one of the things we, we stressed here was that even though many people came to Worcester um, from the south and other parts uh, of the country seeking work, it was very difficult to get jobs in industry in Worcester. Um, there's a census from 1900 that actually breaks down who's working in various industries in Worcester and breaks them down by race and ethnicity, which is very interesting. And there are very few African American men or women working in Worcester industry. So most of them, most of those jobs are going to European immigrants. So the neighborhoods were reasonably open. The schools were integrated. Yep. But the the uh, economic uh, reality of jobs was domestics. Uh, For women, cleaning. yeah cleaning labor intensive jobs. Service, mm -hmm. service, service, service jobs. jobs. Yeah. Um, one industry that did hire black men was the railroads and we have a couple photos of those. Oh, you could be a barber. Um, you could be a barber, you could be a waiter. Again, you have Bullard That's photographing. A you had a question, someone else? Oh, okay. Talking yeah. with descendants was the best part of this whole experience. Just meeting up with folks, sharing what we had, uh, having them share their family memories with us. Um, having them come to see the exhibition and see their ancestors on the wall of the museum. It was really quite exciting. This is Lois Perkins Cato. I, I visited her very early on. Again, a descendant of this massive Perkins, Camden Perkins family. Um, and we had not yet identified this photograph. And I was going through the book and she said, oh, that's my father, that's my grandmother, and that's my aunt. I'm like, okay, well, great, now we know who they are. So that was really exciting, and she was really... And she had the original had photo it. that Bullard made and yeah. gave to her family. So that did happen That was our first one. Yeah. We've only seen that, that twice. Here's the Ward family we talked about before. This is uh, James Harold Ward, Jr., the son of this man here, the one who ended up being uh, the uh, vice president in the Marriott Corporation, one of the first 
uh, African Americans to hold a position of that. Um, this is Professor oh, Raymond Jackson. One. You should tell the story here. This is like one of my. Uh, this is the. This I, is probably I mean, like fact, the I just, got a, I just got an email back from Raymond because my wife and I want to go down and visit him. We've been down to visit him at his home. Raymond's not in, in great health, but he's uh, he's in his mid 80s now. He came up to play. He's a concert pianist. He came up to play for our opening because his great grandfather is that man. <laughs> We went down to visit him. He's the sweetest man. I, I mean, I choke up sometimes just talking about him because he is that nice a human being. We went down to visit him. He had never known that a picture. He idolized him. He would he go. Him. He knew all about him. They'd go at Hope Cemetery. they put flowers on his, his grave. his great-grandfather. 1902, right. and his daughter Sylvia was his grandmother. And he just turned out to be a child prodigy himself, traveled the world, uh, playing uh, everywhere, Russia. And, uh, and in his home, he's got a big poster of his, the real poster of his in 1886, and next to it is his playing in Austria. And the moment came, she had it on a computer, we couldn't give out the pictures yet, but we went down to show him. He had never seen a picture, didn't know one existed of his great grandfather who he idolized. And I, we, I got all this on video. When you showed him that picture, the look on his face, you know, and just a little tear come down, he was just so, so thrilled at that age to see it. And we've become friends. Uh, he came up recently again, went out to eat, and we're going to go down to visit him. And then, because of this exhibit, he found out that coming out of Alabama, Alabama? Yeah, Alabama. Have the photo? no, we don't have them. Oh, it's going to be, yeah, we're going to have that coming up. Okay, we'll do that later. Okay. Um, this is Benetta I told you about earlier, and her mother, Laura Pearson, who unfortunately passed before the exhibition. Uh, but we, she was the one who sort of, uh, both of them were the ones who sort of steered us to the possibility of these being the grandchildren of Bethany Beanie, and it actually did turn out to be the case then. Here's Nick, Nick, Larry and Nick Schuyler, who are the grandchildren of Raymond Schuyler. Okay. This was, it, as Frank said, this was the Board of Research. This was the day we did a preview for um, the, the descent. We had folks who came from all over the country, as far away as Kansas and Miami and all kinds of places um, who were able bigger. to come. And then these are mo even more people who were involved in various ways um, with the exhibition. You can only members. imagine how good it feels to speak to people who never knew their history. Yeah. Again, he's a direct descendant of uh, the Perkinses. She said to me, where can I get, this South was at City Hall, she said, where can I get a picture like this? I said, do you want this one? Uh, the day the exhibition opened in October, um, we had Raymond and then his two young cousins whom he had never met before, <laughs> before this, this photo <coughs> brought them all together. And they, it was the most beautiful, you know, they, they, I think they only practiced like the day before, the first time they got together. We had a packed, if you've ever been into that, the, that court of uh, the art museum, it was packed with people at noon, Saturday noon, the opening day of the exhibition. And they started off by playing Paco Bell's Cannon, and there was not a dry eye not in the dry. house. Yeah, um, we had photographs taken by uh, a Boston photographer who took a lot of, uh, who came the day of the exhibition op uh, preview with the descendants. Um, so I guess, is that, that is this it? Hit it again. Okay. Yes, we have a website, um, bullardphotos.org, where we have all the photographs up, yeah. including in addition, some essays written by uh, some of my students that give some more context and background um, to the all the images that were at the art museum. Um, so please visit and take a look and read uh, what the students have done. Okay, good. I was <laughs> <right>. <laughs> That's good. Well, I feel like